a coup which took place in a coastal country in West Africa, may hit closer to home than you think, with your favorite smartphones and even power lines potentially affected. Why? These items all contain aluminium, and the world's primary source of aluminium is bauxite ore. And it so happens that Guinea, the country where this coup occurred, has the world's largest reserves of bauxite. After years of stability under the previous regime, um, for the first time really since Guinea's independence, all of that certainty, all of that, um, that stability, that predictability of the market was suddenly removed and aluminium prices spiked to 13-year highs. The main concerns were around whether the interim regime would raise taxes, um, whether there would be contract renegotiations with mining firms, um, and in a worst-case scenario, commercially, um, whether renationalisation was on the cards. On the morning of September 5th, 2021, gunshots broke out in Guinea's capital, Conakry, Soldiers from the country's special forces had ousted President Alpha Conde, citing corruption as the motivation. In the process, the coup disrupted nearly a decade of political stability in the mineral-rich nation. Days after, prices of aluminium spiked to a 10-year high on the London Metal Exchange. Markets were rattled by the possible disruption to global supply chains. With these international networks already in crisis, what does this latest blow mean for consumers and businesses around the world? To better understand the impact of the coup and the significance of Guinea's resources, I called up CNBC's global markets reporter, Elliot Smith. Hi, Elliot. Hi, Timo. How are you doing? So, Elliot, tell me the role this country of just 13.1 million people plays on the global stage. So, for a country of 13 million people, Guinea has a, a disproportionate impact on the global supply chain in that regard. Mining accounts for about 35% of Guinea's GDP. Guinea actually hosts 7.4 billion tonnes of bauxite. It's about a quarter of the world's total content. And then we look at iron ore. Guinea's Samandu region, this region in the southeast of Guinea, it's about 110 kilometres. It is host to one of the largest untapped iron ore reserves in the world. The key thing about this iron ore reserve, though, is that it is over 65% iron content. However, much of these reserves remain untapped because of the country's history of political instability. So, Elliot, how has the country's past contributed to this moment in time? So, since um, Guinea gained independence from France, you've had decades of political instability. Post-colonial scars, if you like, um, politically, have, have never really um, been, been relieved. And President Alpha Conde was Guinea's first democratically elected leader in, in 2010. The stability that then ensued uh, enabled Guinea to finally you know, find its, its place in terms of you know, trade and to start uh, a period of sustained economic growth. Initially, Conde's term appeared promising for Guinea's economy as exports of the country's prized mineral bauxite grew. In 2020, the West African country exported 82.4 million tons of bauxite, an increase of more than 300 percent since 2015. Under Conde, the country also maintained a trading relationship with China and Russia, two major importers of its iron and bauxite minerals. In fact, in 2020, Guinea's trading bauxite relationship with both countries was worth an estimated $26.5 billion, 35% of Guinea's GDP. Conde really set out when he was elected in, in 2010 to give Guinea legitimacy on, on the world stage. Um, he'd spent decades fighting the previous tyrannical regimes. He enlisted the likes of Tony Blair and George Soros as advisors uh, when he set out to revolutionize Guinea's economy. Conde built really close alliances with, with China, with Russia, and with international bodies. China has a, a pretty immense presence in the country through the, the Belt and Road Initiative. China is reliant on bauxite exports and you know, iron ore projects in the country. Russia's, you know, Rusal have three bauxite mines and an alumina refinery in the country and accounts for about 42% of Rusal's uh, bauxite productions. If we look at over the last five years, Guinea has, has consistently produced more than 5% GDP growth. So on a headline level, the country was, was heading in the right direction economically. A lot of people were not necessarily feeling this at the ground level. You know, the new mining code that Conde developed um, was, you know, 
on, on the face of it, a reform that helps with you know, transparency on revenues. It aimed to, to hold companies accountable and the World Bank later published a report sort of accusing the mining code of being a, a front for personal enrichment and rewards to benefactors. So, you know, there are, there are two sides to this. In 2020, Alpha Conde announced he was amending the constitution to pursue a third term. But this announcement disgruntled many Guineans who were not reaping the benefits of the country's growing mining sector. He had a pretty consistent record of security forces cracking down on protesters, um, allegedly killing dozens in multiple instances, especially during the protests against the third term that he was seeking, which you know, in itself was a radical amendment to the constitution that the public rose up against, and they were met with bloody force. And that was a factor that helped to rile up the resentment that galvanized the public behind a, a military overthrow, if that was what was necessary. When news of the coup broke, it sent ripples through the rest of the world. Prices of aluminium reached $2,776 per tonne. The coup's leader and interim president, 41-year-old Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya, tried to insulate the mining industry from destabilization brought on by the coup. He exempted miners from a nationwide curfew his army imposed. The rising aluminium costs have already started to hit shipbuilding and, and various other sort of parts of the manufacturing industry. So will we see the relationship Guinea has with China and Russia change because of this coup? Based on um, so analysts that, I, that I've spoken to, it wouldn't necessarily be in China or Russia's interest to uh, go any further than they've already gone, which is they've both um, denounced the coup, uh, both condemned it, but as far as imposing sanctions or doing anything to jeopardise the relationship with the, the current interim administration, it wouldn't suit China or Russia's commercial interests to distance themselves too much. One of the main concerns analysts believe Beijing will have is if the supply chain is affected in a sustained fashion from, from Guinea, then Australia is, is the main alternative. And given the, the sort of frosty relations between Beijing and Canberra, in, in the light of the, you know, the cyber attack allegations and uh, you know, months and months of, of wrangling over trade deals, that, that increased reliance on Australia is probably not something that Beijing is going to want to pursue unless it's an absolute last resort. The military has promised to rewrite the constitution, form a transitional government and leave power by March 2023. But will it stay true to its word? Some you know, think that we can't really do anything but take um, Colonel Dumbia and the military leaders at their word at the moment. They're, they're saying the right things and they are actioning them in the short term. If the junta doesn't stay true to its word, what impact on the global markets could we see? I think that's when, to paraphrase bad boys, um, things get real. Um, in the sense of, so far, the only um, sanctions have come from ECOWAS, the regional body, against the coup leaders themselves. ECOWAS is demanding uh, a return to civilian rule within six months. The, the return to constitutional order is not forthcoming. There will be extreme concerns about the power that it then has, given the, the unconstitutional way in which power was, uh, was seized, and also um, whether international sanctions will come from, um, you know, from other countries, from trading partners. Um, and that's when you, you start to see a bite on supply chains. One of analysts' key concerns is um, the social and economic grievances that provide a fertile ground for this coup won't go away overnight. Um, obviously, the, the junta have promised radical reforms, elimination of corruption, um, a filtration of the economic benefits of, of the mining industry to the wider public. If they don't deliver on those promises quickly, or if they don't deliver on the promise of a return to civilian rule quickly, the risk of social unrest spiking again um, and jeopardising economic stability um, is, is higher than, than it was before uh, the coup happened. Which is your favourite African country that you've been to? And you have to say Ghana because that's where I'm from. But yeah, no, I'm, abs cool. I'm absolutely <laughs> snookered there, aren't I? I? If I don't say Ghana, I might as well just dive out the window. <laughs> <laughs> no. exactly. Absolutely, absolutely Ghana, without a shadow of a doubt.